Lorach is a small German market town set on the edge of the Black Forest where France and Germany and Switzerland come together. It's about the size of Bogner Regis. Nothing very much happens here. Most of the people work at the local chocolate factory. But just down the road here from this main square, there's a research project being carried out which may have considerable effect on what's going on in orbit around the Earth at the end of this century. You see, by about 1995, it's reckoned that the total value of the hardware floating around up there in space will be about 1,000 million pounds of somebody's money. And that's a very expensive pile of equipment to throw away if it ever goes wrong. Which is why, of course, the space shuttle's been developed to get up there and repair the satellites, communication satellites, weather watch, crop analysis programs, all that kind of thing. But the man who runs this particular research project, his name's Professor Hans Kleinwächter, believes that the one weak link in that repair system will be the astronaut himself. He and many others prefer machines because they say they're more efficient and of course they're much more expendable. Which is why this particular harness I'm being strapped into, it's called an exoskeleton, was developed in the first place. You see, its job is to send out signals to control remotely a machine in space and make it easier to have an automated repairman fixing the satellites. The system works like this. Every time I move a joint, a tiny potentiometer on the joint senses the movement, turns it into an electrical signal and sends the command to the remote machine. Now, the thing that makes this whole system unique is that there are seven separate sources of signals. One for moving the shoulder back and forward, one for moving the shoulder out and in, and one for rotating the shoulder. Then one for moving the elbow up and down, one for rotating the forearm, one for pitching the hand up and down, and the seventh and last for controlling the hand grip itself. Now, these signals are sent over there, in this case, to Sintelman. That stands for Synchronized Telemanipulator. And he works either, in this case, by cable, or if he's in space, he takes his orders by radio. Now, drive motors set at every joint on Sintelman pick up those orders and enable him to do anything I do, like this. And he can also see, thanks to two independent television cameras set in his head. Now, the pictures from those two cameras are transmitted to two monitor screens in front of me on this bank of controls. One of the uh, monitors shows what his left eye sees, and the other monitor shows what his right eye sees. In between the two monitors, at a diagonal, is a polarised mirror, which allows the light from the left eye monitor to come straight through at me, and the light from the right eye monitor to be reflected out to me. Now, by putting on a pair of polarised spectacles... Thank you, Walter. The left lens of these spectacles picks up the left eye picture and the right lens of these spectacles picks up the right eye picture and so I get three-dimensional vision. And furthermore, with the foot control down here, I can tilt the eyes up and down. Now, the reason why Sintelman is so clever is because I am, not me personally, but me as a human being. Because in my brain, for very basic movements, I have already programmed memories. So when I decide to do something, my brain simply flashes an already programmed sequence to my body, and my body obeys without thinking. And that goes for any basic, simple movement for a human being. But when you translate it to a machine, you see just how complex that series is. Like pouring yourself a drink, for example. OK, first the bottle. Swivel the forearm left, swivel the hand slightly left, open the hand, move the shoulder forward very carefully. Wow. Easing it in. Then tilt the forearm down slightly. That's it. Close the hand. Close the hand. Got the bottle. <laughs> Stage one. OK, bring in the left hand. Swivel the elbow outwards. Tilt the hand slightly and get the cork, I hope. Now the glass. Now pitch the forearm forward and up. Close the hand. Got it. Now, move the right forearm up. Swivel the forearm. 
anti-clockwise, very slowly, and there it goes. <laughs> Sintelman has one other ability, as yet in the early stages, he will grip an object only as hard as I want to grip it. And this is how that happens. When I move my hand to grip, I put a stress onto this metal bar, and that stress is transferred along through the metal to this metal bar. And these tiny strain gauges sitting on top of the bar sense how much the bar is distorting, and therefore how much stress it's under, and convert that stress to an electrical signal which commands Sintelman's hand to put exactly that amount of stress on the object. Now, eventually, Professor Kleinvechter is going to develop a system so sensitive that there will be feedback to the operator's hand, and he will literally get a sense of feel from the mechanical hand. But that's uh, sometime in the future as yet. Even now, though, Sintelman is remarkably sensitive. Watch this. And just to prove we're not fooling you with a hard-boiled egg. And at the other extreme, remember he's a machine and extremely strong, with 120 pounds pressure, watch what happens to this metal ring. The American Space Agency is already interested in Sintelman, and plans are going ahead for a spaceflight version. Back on Earth, of course, the potential is tremendous. Under the sea, in radioactive situations, in situations where there are high temperatures, any kind of emergency. In fact, anywhere a man can't go, Sintelman can. So the future does look pretty rosy for him and other machines like him, as they get to work saving the rest of us a lot of effort and bother. And I, for one, will always drink to that. Cheers.